Россиев. Я очень рад, что вы сегодня с нами. И большое вам спасибо за, за то, что вы пришли, что, вы, что у вас есть время, что вы согласились присутствовать. Меня зовут Антон Чесноков. Я директор Российской Дома культуры и Россотрудничества в Лондоне. И я буду модератором этого мероприятия. План очень простой. Мы где-то начнем через 10 минут презентацию книги, потом мы хотим ваши взгляды, мнения в отношении этой книги. У каждого будет примерно 5-10 минут, да, будет потом перевод, если нужен, пожалуйста, используйте кнопку перевода снизу, российский, русский, английский или наоборот. Пожалуйста, используйте. Пожалуйста, дамы и господа, для меня большая честь сегодня представить эту прекрасную, интересную, храброго, мужественного, удивительного человека, который, несмотря на локдаун, на COVID-19, тем не менее, у нас три национальных локдауна, сейчас у нас вот третий локдаун сейчас, и тем не менее, он очень продуктивный, наконец, он опубликовал эту уникальную книгу, это уникальная книга. Это о России, она принципиально важна для многих, для политиков, дипломатов, для широкой публики, для студентов, для всех. Очень важна, кто действительно хотят понять источники и мотивы, которым объясняется российское возникновение, возрождение России и возвращение России на мировой рынок. Пожалуйста, добро пожаловать. Хочу поприветствовать Маркуса Пандополса, который будет говорить о своей новой книге. Вставая Россия, возвращение России в мировую политику. And appears frequently on Sky News, BBC, RT, Al Jazeera, Press TV, etc. As a analyst on contemporary Russian affairs, he also specializes in Serbia and the former Yugoslavia, and uh, an analyst in matters relating to Syria, Iran, uh, international relations in general, and British politics. His academic paper on Russophobia for the International Lihachov Scientific Conference and his speech at the House of Lords on the origins of the current tension between America and Russia received significant media coverage. Marcus is a member of Parliamentary Press Gallery of the United Kingdom in his capacity as a publisher and the editor of Politics First. So great to have you, Marcus. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anton. Good morning to the audience in Britain and good morning to the audience in Russia. And thank you for being with me here today to listen to my presentation on my new book, Arise, Russia, The Return of Russia to World Politics. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to the Russian Culture House for having hosted uh, today's presentation and special thanks to Anton Chesnikov for having facilitated today's event. I discovered Russia, or as it was then, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, when I was about seven years of age and developed a passion and intrigue for Russian history, Russian culture and the Russian people from that moment onwards. I remember, whilst at both primary and secondary school, relaying to pupils and teachers alike what I had learnt about Russia from books and documentaries. Their response was one of bewilderment. They could not fathom why it was that such a young child had a profound fascination about a country which had a history of stigma attached to it in the West. But the responses to my passion for Russia were not always ones of perplexity. When I was studying A-level history, my magnificent history teacher discovered through a conversation which she had had with me prior to one of our lessons, that I had been privately reading about the Great Patriotic War since my childhood. And so she asked me whether I would give a two hour lecture to our history class on the Eastern Front, 1941 to 1945, in one of the periods in which she was scheduled to teach us. I joyfully accepted the invitation. Further to that, it was also when I was an A-level student when my English literature teacher became aware of my interest in the great, great patriotic war and proposed to me that I give a speech before the local mayor on the Soviet Union's involvement in the Second World War, the cardinal role which the Red Army played in the defeat of the Third Reich, and the colossal loss in life suffered by the Soviet people in their victory over national socialism. Again, I enthusiastically accepted the invitation. By my early teenage years, I had decided to work towards training as a historian of Russia. And this is what happened, culminating in me being awarded a PhD in Russian history from Royal Holloway, University of London, bringing to an end eight years of continuous study at university from the age of 19. 
The title of my doctoral thesis is British Official Perceptions of the Red Army, 1934 to 1945. My thesis examined how, firstly, British assessments of Soviet military potential during the 1930s and the 1940s played a role in the British government's strategic planning in this period, and how, from the mid to late 1940s, a small group of courageous and prudent thinking British diplomats in the Northern Department, led by a one Lawrence Collier, made the case for an alliance with the USSR as a means of deterring Nazi Germany from territorial expansion. And secondly, my thesis documented how the historic phenomenon of racial prejudices towards Russians in Whitehall often clouded the judgments of British observers, especially military officials, when assessing the military prowess of the USSR. I decided to write Arise Russia, the return of Russia to world politics, so, so as to share my analysis based on years worth of research together with interviews with leading politicians and academics on how it is that Russia today is a resurgent global power and, more than that, a superpower once more. And it is my hope that, my, that Arise, uh, Arise Russia will make a humble contribution to discussions both inside and outside of the Russian Federation concerning Russian foreign policy and how the Kremlin's objectives are today being realized on the international stage. Further to that, in an age where Western mainstream media has completely lost all pretense to being independent, impartial, and credible, my reason for writing a book on modern day Russia was also to address and counter the appallingly malicious lies being told about contemporary Russia, as well as lies about the Soviet Union by Western politicians and journalists, something which is fueled by their racism towards Russians or Russophobia, whether they are conscious of this or not. On that basis, my book, on that basis, my hope is that Western audiences will, through reading my book, draw the conclusion that Russia is far from being the devil incarnate which their politicians and journalists have historically projected the country is constituting. My book will enlighten the average American and the average Briton who are both overwhelmingly ignorant about the role of the USSR in the Second World War, on how 88% of Nazi Germany's total military losses in this war were incurred fighting the Red Army, hence the outcome of the war was decisively decided on the Russian front, and that, ultimately, Joseph Stalin's industrialization of the USSR was the crucial factor in the Red Army's defeat of the Wehrmacht. Inter rather interestingly, the main factor in accounting for the defeat of the Imperial Russian Army during the Great War was the absence of an industrial base in the Russian Empire capable of sustaining the Russian Army at a time of major war. The average American and the average Briton will learn that the Soviet Union was not a prison of peoples as depicted in the West, and that the Bolshevik state achieved many successes for the ordinary Soviet person, including a job and home for life, outstanding education and health systems, and the eradication of homelessness. They will realize that the end of the USSR ushered in a calamitous period for the Russian people and other peoples of the former Soviet Union too. They will understand that under the leadership of President Vladimir Putin, Russia is no longer the decrepit country that it was in the 1990s as a consequence of the catastrophic policies of Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin and is instead today able to look after its citizens at home, providing them with security and stability, and is able to defend Russian interests across the world. Britons and Americans will become familiar with how Russia played the decisive role in the defeat of both ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria, and they will realize that Russia, far from seeking expansionism, as the West actually seeks, is pursuing foreign policy objectives aimed at defending and augmenting the national security of the Russian Federation. On that basis, it is my desire that my book will help to dispel the appalling racial stereotyping of the Russian people in the West, while showing Russia to be a peaceful country which is safeguarding both its freedom and independence, protecting its cultural and spiritual values, preserving its identity, and defending itself from all threats, including NATO and Islamist terrorism.
both of which enjoy an informal strategic partnership with one another, as demonstrated in, for instance, Libya and Syria. Now, turning to some specific contents of my book, I begin by examining what led up to the dissolution of the USSR and the consequences of this for Russia, both at home and abroad, establishing that the Soviet Union did not collapse, as is routinely told in the West, but rather was dissolved, and dissolved by three politicians in blatant disregard to the wishes of 76% of the Soviet people who, in March of 1991, voted to preserve the USSR. The three politicians who so arrogantly and contemptuously defied the will of the Soviet people were Boris Yeltsin, head of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, Leonid Kravchuk, head of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, and Stanislav Shushkevich, head of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. I then detail how President Putin set about restoring law and order and security and stability inside of Russia, countering the presence on Russian soil of NGOs which had ties to Western special services and which were intent on weakening Russian form within by fomenting political instability in Russian society. Following on from that, I analyzed the Russian Federation's contemporary relations with 25 countries, beginning in the former Soviet space, which I consider imperative to Moscow's newfound power on the international stage. The countries I, I cover include Cuba, Venezuela, Belarus, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Serbia, Bulgaria, Syria, Iran, China, and North Korea. As well as analyzing the Kremlin's relations with those 25 countries, I also provide a forecast of how these ties will develop in both the short and long term. My book asserts that securing Russia's predominance in the near abroad, the post-Soviet space, is the foremost priority for Russian foreign policy making. And with the notable exceptions of the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, together with Ukraine, this objective has been resoundingly achieved during President Putin's tenure in office. It is my contention that Russia would not be in Syria or in Venezuela today if the near abroad had not been largely secured by the Kremlin. In short, Russia would not have resurrected its lost superpower status had the Americans and the Chinese been successful in their quests during the 1990s and 2000s to supplant Russian predominance in, for example, Central Asia. Staying with the near abroad, and specifically Ukraine, I have described this country in my book as Russia's soft underbelly and contended that the Kremlin will use all means at its disposal to avert Ukrainian entry into NATO, adding that the artificial country which is Ukraine will cease to exist in its current form as a result of the dangerously insatiable lust of the Americans to enlist the country into the Western military bloc. Turning to Russia's relationship with China, my book averts that, that Russian-Sino relations are based on necessity, not affinity. Russia needs the huge Chinese market upon which to sell its oil and gas to, so as to help Russia, so as to help finance Russian resurgence in the international arena, while China requires Russian energy to sustain its remarkable economic, e economic growth, as well as high-tech Russian military weapons, systems and components in order to continue with the immense progress which has been made by the People's Liberation Army. Notwithstanding the, act the actuality surrounding present-day relations between Moscow and Beijing, together with numerous challenges facing this, this relationship, including how Russia's Eurasian Economic Union and China's Belt and Road Initiative are set to be rivals as they will compete in the long term over Central Asia, the prognosis for the informal strategic partnership between the two Asiatic giants promises to be an exceedingly positive one. After all, for both countries to continue to grow and prosper in a world dominated by America, they need each other. In Russia's case, to preserve its superpower status, and in China's case, to become a superpower. 
Finally, my book submits that Russia's legal and emphatically successful military intervention in the Syrian conflict demonstrates, more than any other, irrefutable evidence that Russia is again a superpower. Not a superpower in the sense that the Soviet Union, the most powerful Russian state in history, was, but nonetheless still a superpower. That the Russian Federation was able to prosecute a war thousands of miles away from Russian soil against exceedingly powerful Islamist terrorist groups and to have all but erad eradicated their malignant existences in Syria proved to be a turning point in geopolitics. Incidentally, the potent power which Al-Qaeda and ISIS once possessed in Syria is a matter which American and British politicians and journalists alike are, unsurprisingly, mute on. Who armed the terrorists? Who trained the terrorists? Who provided logistical assistance to them? And who financed them? Those questions, if put to Western politicians and mainstream journalists, will bring about an uncomfortable or gormless look on their faces, I assure you. But returning to the Russian intervention in Syria, it was here where, excluding in the near abroad, post-Soviet Russia for the first time defeated an American geostrategic objective in another country with the use of military force, with Moscow having scuppered Washington's attempts to overthrow the Syrian government with the use of, with the use of terrorist proxies. Second, Russia's re-entry into the Middle East, which the Kremlin had been planning for since around the mid-2000s, was decisively secured by the successful Russian military operation in Syria. So much so that Russia is now back in vogue in the Arab world on account of it having proven its credentials in waging a merciless war on Islamist terrorism. Third, the relationship between Moscow and Damascus has been transformed by Russia's successful intervention in the Syrian conflict. The Kremlin is today the overseer of Syria's domestic and foreign policy, the price of Russia having saved the Arab country from Islamist tyranny. That startling achievement of Putin's Russia is something that not even the Soviet Union managed to accomplish in Syria. I submit that some comparisons can be made between the USSR's relationship with East Germany and modern day relations and modern day Russia's relationship with Syria. Finally, Syria is now a springboard upon which Russia can project its newfound influence and power to other parts of the Middle East, as well as in North Africa, with an unofficial strategic relationship between Russia, Syria, Iran and Hezbollah having emerged as a consequence in the Middle East as a consequence of the Russian success in the Syrian conflict. And this unofficial strategic relationship will challenge the unofficial strategic relationship in the Middle East, comprising of America, Britain, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. How do I account in my book for Russia's resurrection in global politics? Well, on account of two factors. Firstly, the unbreakable will and extraordinary, and, and extraordinary levels of endurance and endeavor of the Russian people who only want to live in a life of, who only want to live a life of security and stability in line with their cultural and spiritual values, knowing that the Russian motherland is protected from all threats, internal and external, and that Russia is playing its rightful role in world affairs. And the second factor is on account of the leadership of President Putin, which involved securing the territorial integrity of the Russian Federation, freeing Russia from the shackles of Yeltsin-era loans from the International Monetary Fund, which is one of America's most lethal of geostrategic weapons, recentralizing Russia, which is absolutely crucial in effectively governing a country as enormous and, div and diverse as Russia is, reintroducing, reintroducing strong and authoritarian leadership in Russia, which is exactly how Russia has to be managed, and exactly what the ordinary Russian expects. After all, when Russia is not run in this manner, anarchy materializes, as it did under Tsar Nicholas II, Gorbachev, and Yeltsin. And finally, capitalizing on Russia's huge energy reserves so that Russia could first become strong at home and then project this power outside of the Russian Federation's borders. 
History will, ju will judge President Putin to be one of Russia's greatest ever leaders, alongside Stalin and Peter the Great. In essence, Peter made Russia a great power, Stalin transformed Russia into a superpower, and Putin re-established Russia as a superpower. That Russia has risen is an actuality that will manifest itself in Moscow continuing to play an immense role in determining the direction of world politics for the foreseeable future. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus, for this extensive uh, introduction. Um, Professor Neil Kent, uh, would you like to evaluate on that? Professor Neil Kent is associate of the Scott Polar Research. От европейской истории, культуры Российской академики, искусств, культуры и скульптуры, в которой он работал больше десяти лет. Он написал книги про Крым, про Крым, про Санкт-Петербург и Санкт-Петербурге. Эти книги были переведены на китайский язык даже, и также много интересных других тем о которых он скоро будет писать как краткую историю российской ортодоксальной православной церкви. Сколько, сколько времени у меня для, для речи? Ну, пять, пять минут наверняка есть. Да? Я хочу сказать следующее. К сожалению, я не читал эту интересную книгу, и поэтому я не могу комментировать эту книгу. Я бы хотел просто... Yes, um, there are various uh, questions I'd like to pose, and perhaps one uh, statement um, I'd like to make from my familiarity with the author's writings, and that is, um, I'd like to preface by saying, personally, I'm less convinced of the... Um, economic uh, uh, so-called machinations of the United States towards Russia, I think um, the, myself, the principal reason at the moment for the antagonism on a political level between the two countries is based on an um, ideology, namely the United States, as the Soviet Union was in former days, is convinced that its political ideology is the greatest on earth and therefore all countries should adopt american style democracy and human rights and therefore because that is not approximated in the american view or the british view in russia therefore um it is um uh, committing offenses now, Russia has a different system, uh, a different history, a different culture, and doesn't accept the American one. But anyway, the bottom line I want to make on this is rather that I think it's more ideological rather than um, economic. That is, I don't think that the primary motivation is that America wants to ruin Russia economically for uh, Machiavellian reasons, but wants to coerce Russia into adopting uh, American-style democratic and human rights values. Now, moving on from that statement, I'd like to um, ask various questions. Uh, I'm based academically at Cambridge, and we're used to being provocative. Um, and so I would like to ask, first of all, um, uh, in, on a, um, a positive question, positive note, um, I've heard in diplomatic circles, British diplomatic circles, that um, one of the main goals at the moment with respect to Russia and Britain is to build a bridge or bridges between our two countries on a whole variety of cultural uh, planes. So I wondered if you could perhaps suggest, instead of um, people looking all the time at the negative aspects, what positive cultural bridges could be built with arts, music, architecture, um, uh, a plethora of possible uh, themes, uh, which would allow closer, warmer ties to be built between Britain and Russia. The second thing I would like to ask is, do you think that the churches 
that is the Russian Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and other churches could somehow also form bridges. I mean, famously, um, as uh, it states in the New Testament, in uh, Christianity, um, in Christ there is no Jew or non-Jew. One would assume that meant also um, in humanity, ultimately, in a profound philosophical sense, there is no uh, um, Englishman, Scot, Russian. Everyone are people beloved by God. What role could the churches have in uh, building bridges between the two countries? Another question I'd like to ask, which um, I don't think you mentioned in your talk, but I think it's profoundly important, is that um, although uh, one could argue that uh, Russia has been extremely successful um, in achieving its uh, goals on a the level of foreign uh, political and military policy, um, a, it seems to me a big um, fly in the ointment is still the Russian economy. And um, what do you see as the future development of the Russian economy such that instead of Russia's economy being the size of, of people famously say Italy or the Netherlands, it actually becomes one of the great world economies. Do you see that happening? And uh, if so, how do you see that taking place? Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, let me say, Professor Kent, that I concur with you. The clash we see at the moment between America and Russia on the international stage is ideologically driven. There is no uh, question about it that during the Cold War and since the end of the Cold War, uh, America looks to not just preserve its global mastery, but also to augment its global mastery. And the prime challenge to its global supremacy is Russia. And I believe that the Americans are using, amongst other means, economic warfare to try and asphyxiate the Russian economy. Because though the Russian economy um, has grown into, in my opinion, a very robust one, after all, it has since 2014 withstood quite severe American and EU sanctions placed on it. Nonetheless, the Russian economy is still not a diverse one. And I believe that the Americans, American foreign policymakers, American economic policymakers, uh, consider the fact that Russia's economy is still not a diverse one to probably be the Achilles heel uh, of the Russian Federation. Now, turning to Britain and Russia, Britain and Russia are traditional foes. And they have been ever since diplomatic relations were established between London and Moscow in the 1500s. That said, however, cultural exchanges between the two countries have survived despite there being a tremendous level of hostility and uh, suspicion between the uh, British and Russian establishments. So if we look during the First World War and the Second World War, cultural awareness of Russia in Britain um, grew, attained very, very significant levels. And I have to say myself, who having done research on public opinion uh, in Russia during the uh, British public opinion uh, towards Russia during the Great, Great War and also during the Second World War, was by and large positive. So I do think that um, uh, that uh, historical positive actuality should be continued and it should be looked to be increased upon. However, no one should be under any illusion that even if cultural awareness between Britain and Russia, between the British, uh, between the ordinary Britain and the ordinary Russian achieves even uh, greater levels, that this is going to usher in a new relationship, a new dawn between Britain and Russia. That will not happen. As I said, both countries are historical adversaries 
and that is only going to increase further now that Russia is a superpower again. Of course, British, uh, British foreign policymakers um, would very much like for Russia to be how it was in the 1990s, uh, um, you know, namely uh, subservient to America and dependent on the IMF, or put it in another way, on an IMF um, life support machine. Now that Russia is a resurgent power, that is causing uh, considerable indignation um, in Whitehall. And as regards to the role of the churches in Britain uh, and, in, uh, and in Russia, well, once again, um, uh, you know, spiritual connections between the uh, British people and the Russian people are important. They were there during the Great War, they were there during the Second World War. I should also add as well, through research I've carried out, they were there during the Crimean War. There were some uh, British people who found it somewhat peculiar that uh, Britain uh, and France were prosecuting a war against a very pious Christian country, the Russian Empire, in support of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, yes, I, I do believe that spiritual uh, values, um, common spiritual values between Britain and Russia should be increased. But once again, that is not going to change the uh, political relationship between uh, Britain and Russia um, at all. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Professor Kent. Thank you. Now uh, we can move on to our next speaker, uh, Fyodor Alexandrovich Lukyanov, Chief Editor of the Russia in Global Politics Journal, Chairman of the Presidium of the Council of the Foreign and Defense Policy of Russia, Director of Scientific Work of the International Discussion Club, Valdai. Fyodor Alexandrovich, Russia. Uh, uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Should I speak English or Russian? Or what is the... Uh, English preferably. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. <clears throat> yeah, one small correction. Uh, the name of the journal is Russian Global Affairs, not Russian Global Politics. Uh, I think it's a very uh, good timing for uh, such a discussion and uh, to publish such a book, uh, especially for the British and European and Western uh, readership. Of course, uh, much of what uh, uh, is being uh, described in, in, in this uh, wonderful book uh, is very well known to, to Russian uh, people, but uh, it's quite useful to remind uh, those who are interested in, in, in the UK or broader uh, about uh, some kind of alternative views on, on Russia, which are unfortunately very uh, scarcely represented in the current uh, debate in, in the West. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, the necessity to discuss this issue is even more uh, relevant and uh, important because we are just now entering a completely new moment in the relationship between Russia and uh, the West. Of course, this is part of uh, fundamental changes in the international affairs at large. Uh, what uh, is being described in this book explains us why uh, the, uh, this, this relationship uh, failed, basically. And uh, the main emphasis is uh, on the uh, inability of the West to understand Russia uh, rightly, to, to get it to get it right, which I fully agree. At the same time, if we look at uh, our side, at the Russian side, uh, I think it will be wrong to deny that the idea that Russia, initially Soviet Union at the very late stage of its development and later on Russia, were very much keen to become part of a political uh, entourage uh, designed and established by Western countries, in particular the United States. Uh, 
it's fantastically interesting period. I, I, I hope that scholars and historians and political scientists will uh, dedicate a lot of time and work to analysis of what happened in late 80s, early 90s, just from the point of view why such a promising uh, future for relationship between Russia, Soviet Union slash Russia and uh, the West uh, uh, brought us uh, the end to such an uh, unhappy uh, conclusion. But anyway, that, that was, uh, as we can remember that period, that was more or less consensus view in our country in late Gorbachev years and early Yeltsin years that Russia had no choice but to become part of this big political, liberal political project, new political, uh, world, political liberal world order or new world order as it was described by uh, first Gorbachev and then uh, George H.W. Bush. Of course, Gorbachev had another idea about future new world order than uh, it uh, was uh, happening after, after him in 1990s. For Gorbachev, it was, it was no idea that Russia or Soviet Union at his time would uh, be subordinated to rules and norms formulated somewhere else. His idea was, uh, as I humbly can suggest, that Soviet Union and the West after the end of the Cold War would sit together and uh, uh, work on common rules, on rules how the new world after confrontation should look like. It never happened, partially because collapse of the Soviet Union, partially because I think the Western idea was never that bright to allow uh, somebody else we beat Russia, beat China, whoever, to uh, participate in formulation of rules. Anyway, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, for quite a long period, actually uh, uh, till uh, maybe need, uh, mid 2000s, Russia was still interested to find a niche, to find a place inside this Western led world order. And uh, uh, more than that, uh, I guess that uh, President Putin at his uh, first period uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in Kremlin, he made enormous efforts to try to explain to the West that Russia is ready actually to become, to become part of this greater Europe or um, the big liberal West uh, project. But of course, Russia wanted special treatment. It was never uh, perceived in the right way. And after, after that, uh, the, uh, understanding came, realization came that it was simply impossible, and then you know what happened. I think now we are entering a completely new stage, which is very important for uh, analysis. Uh, recently, uh, a Russian foreign minister publicly stated in very harsh form that we are ready to actually completely cut ties, cut relationship with the European Union. He didn't mention Europe, he didn't mention particular countries, but he said about European Union as an institution. And I think it was a very important statement, slightly misunderstood in the West. It was not an idea that Russia would turn off from Europe. It was an idea that Russia finally uh, abandons this initial idea that Russia can become part of political project led by the West because uh, the so-called greater Europe uh, uh, picture, the greater Europe idea uh, as uh, developed in late 1990s, early 2000s, that was actually uh, an attempt, very vague one, by the way, to find how to accommodate Russia inside this European sphere, sphere led by Brussels. And now, and, and again, I, I think it's very important to repeat that Russia was ready to try it at the beginning, not anymore. And that means that we are moving towards uh, a new stage in the in, in, in relationship, which maybe will look like, uh, I don't know, 19th century politics more than 20th century. When Russia is part a place as one of uh, great powers in, in Eurasia, 
which does not exclude that uh, relationship with the European Union, with European countries, with anybody uh, in this space might be productive, constructive, uh, co cooperative, but a relationship between actors which operate according to their own interests and their own ideas. And this is, again, very much different from what we had after collapse of the Soviet Union, when Russia tried to operate according to somebody else's ideas. And this new stage, uh, on the one hand, it opens a lot of new opportunities because it can theoretically remove a lot of psychological, ideological, and emotional pressure, which uh, uh, the relationship before was characterized of by. Uh, at the same time, it requires one key element that the West, European Union, United States from different angles, but still would accept that previous era's idea that Russia should be transformed into something else to be more uh, compatible with the Western political systems, this idea is a non-starter at all anymore. I don't see this understanding yet. We see that today, just today, European Union should decide about new sanctions because of Russian domestic situation. And I think it's a very important thing that whatever we here in Russia think about our domestic situation, I'm not a big fan of uh, a lot of things happening here, but it's, it's really up to Russia and up to Russians to uh, deal with this. When the European Union on, or, or the United States try to influence those processes inside Russia, they automatically put Russian uh, government and partially or to a large extent Russian society in the situation of uh, clear and flat denial of everything which is coming from there. Especially now when all countries in the world are extremely vulnerable because of pandemic, because of uh, uh, social economic crisis and so on. And I think that we, are re we really need to start to think about new mode of relationship while when, when all parts are actually highly interested in cooperation, highly interested because everybody is in a very bad shape, be it Europe, be it Britain, be it US, be it even China, no, Russia, of course, as well. And the more ideological prejudices, the more ideological uh, prefab constructions, the less uh, opportunity to pragmatically cooperate. Russia, I think, would be much more uh, willing to be a constructive part of uh, different social, economic, and political processes in the world in case we would be able, all of us, to put aside this idea from the previous period that all countries should, to a certain extent, uh, stick to uh, a setup of norms as they are seen from, from Washington or Brussels. Again, I don't see those signs yet, but at the same time, I think we can arrive to that quite quickly because uh, in, in real terms, we see that be it United States, Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, who else, China, India, Russia, everybody is so much focused on domestic development, domestic sustainability, domestic resilience, that actually all the rest is not as important as before. And the moment we acknowledge that publicly, that will be the beginning of a new start. Thank you very much for your book and for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Marcus, would you like to add something, evaluate on that? Yes. Uh, firstly, in his memoirs, Andrei Gromyko, Russia's greatest ever diplomat, wrote how in the immediate period following the creation of NATO, the USSR expressed an interest to the Americans of itself joining the Western military bloc. But uh, this uh, interest was uh, very quickly declined by the Americans, which goes to show that the USSR in the post-war years, the post-Second World War years, 
was still interested in continuing the alliance uh, which it enjoyed during the Second World War with both America and Britain. And if we fast forward to 2000, when uh, Bill Clinton made an official visit to Russia in his capacity as president, uh, Putin has also recalled how he put he floated the idea to Clinton of the Russian Federation joining NATO, but once again, uh, that invitation was declined. And we hear today in America and Britain how Vladimir Putin, uh, from the time he ascended to power in the Kremlin, was set on confronting the West. Well, that is just absolutely not true. From 2000 to 2002, President Putin was looking to establish a uh, global partnership between the West, uh, principally America, and Russia, but an equal partnership. And that is why that global partnership never materialized, because the Americans did not want to be involved in a relationship with Russia, which was to be an equal one. They were content for the partnership between uh, America and Russia, as it was under Yeltsin, to continue when Russia was subservient to America. However, from 2000 onwards, that is when uh, Vladimir Putin came to realize that uh, no, matter, no matter how much uh, Putin was prepared to extend the hand of cooperation to the Americans, America was set on containing Russia and then weaken, weakening uh, and weakening Russia. So um, that is why we have this, uh, that is why we have this clash today, because the Americans are simply not prepared to share the handling of world affairs with any country which can challenge American or Western global supremacy. There are some commentators who say that China is going to, at some point, clash globally with America. Well, whilst I'm, whilst I'm not downplaying the tension between uh, Washington and Beijing at present, after all, there is a trade war between the Americans and the Chinese. Nonetheless, the Chinese economic miracle of the last four decades, which began, began under Deng Xiaoping, has been overwhelmingly based on China's economic trade and investment relationship with America. Therefore, it is not in the interests for China to confront America globally. It's certainly not in the interest of the American economy for there to be a rupture in uh, economic relations between Washington and Beijing. But if there was to be a rupture, who would suffer more? Well, I put it to you, the Chinese economy would suffer far more. So that means the only real challenge in the long term to American global supremacy, American mastery in the international arena comes from Russia. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you. And now it's, it's a good lead to uh, let me present uh, Dr. Alexey Anatolyevich Gramyka, Russian historian and uh, political scientist, director of the Institute of Europe of the Russian Academy of Sciences and corresponding member of RAS. Um, Doctor of Political Science, as I said, uh, the specialist in European Studies and International Relations and Security, Chief Editor of the Contemporary Europe magazine. Alexey Anatolyevich, thank you Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting all of us to uh, discuss uh, this book by Marcus uh, Papadopoulos. This is quite an uh, extraordinary book, and uh, I will try to uh, explain why from, from my point of view. So I would like to make uh, several observations and several uh, comments. And uh, uh, I uh, presume that uh, Marcus would uh, decide what part of my, of my talk to uh, reflect on. Well, uh, Firstly, uh, on the book uh, and on some of my guesses uh, why this uh, product has uh, emerged, uh, well, I uh, haven't read it because uh, it is not yet uh, 
available. Uh, it has been just uh, printed. I hope very much that uh, that uh, it will be available in uh, Russia and not just for those who are going to uh, buy it via uh, uh, internet. Uh, and uh, also, I think that uh, uh, it would be very good if the book uh, will be uh, translated into Russian. Because for uh, Russians to read this book, uh, let me uh, put forward this idea uh, could be uh, also very uh, valuable uh, because we will see uh, a lot of Russians will see that uh, uh, such kind of uh, books may emerge uh, in Western uh, countries and not uh, just the stuff, uh, part of which is serious and part of which is uh, laughable. Uh, the main point of which is to uh, castigate uh, and to criticize Russia for this or, or for that. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the book uh, would not have uh, appeared if not uh, for the personal experience of uh, Marcus and Marcus sta uh, started his uh, his talk um, his uh, presentation with uh, explaining uh, and recalling his uh, his uh, uh, experience in uh, early life and it seems to me that it is very important for any specialist in uh, affairs of any country or region to know this uh, region uh, personally and that means uh, it is not necessary to live as a, a child uh, somewhere but uh, if uh, even you are already a grown-up person uh, you should go there you should uh, spend time there you should meet people you should listen etc uh, etc uh, et and i think that this personal experience of marcus uh, contributed hugely uh, into his well set of set of mind uh, and uh, into his uh, ability to uh, perceive both uh, well strong and weak sides of uh, my country uh, by the way uh, if this book is translated into russian then uh, um, don't doubt uh, it will be uh, fiercely debated <laughs> because in uh, Russia we have, uh, well, a range of uh, opinions, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, multiple views on, uh, on our history, on the nature of our state, etc., uh, etc., a very strong uh, liberal wing and a very strong conservative wing so uh, the book will be a very uh, good platform for for discussions um, well my second uh, observation uh, is that uh, if to uh, paraphrase uh, James uh, Fenimore Cooper whom we uh, all of us read while we were uh, children or uh, adolescents uh, he is, uh, well, uh, one of few of uh, Mohicans. Uh, these days there are uh, really very few people who, uh, see, uh, who uh, seriously try to uh, understand Russia. And this is uh, something what uh, can be said not just uh, about the situation in the United Kingdom, but, uh, uh, but uh, almost in all major uh, countries. And this lack of uh, expertise and insight is one of the reasons why so, ma so many people so uh, easily, uh, you know, may judge or, or ill judge uh, about uh, Russia. I uh, remember how in one of the uh, papers of the House of uh, Commons, and uh, Yelena will uh, substantiate it or, or correct me, was five or six years uh, ago uh, it was said by the by the British uh, deputies that uh, one of the uh, critics uh, towards the British uh, government was a very a very weak uh, policy uh, towards uh, breeding 
specialists in uh, Russian, Russian language, in Russian culture, in Russian politics. So uh, from year to year, fewer, fewer people and bigger and bigger, uh, you know, this pile of stereotypes and cliche, etc., etc. Um, well, uh, my third uh, observation is the book is so uh, uh, unusual, not uh, only per se, but uh, because uh, it is so uh, lonely in the ocean of anti-Russian uh, uh, propaganda. And this is uh, something what uh, hurts, you know, our discourse and uh, discussions uh, so much uh, on both sides uh, of, uh, of this uh, discussion. Uh, my next point uh, is that, well, on uh, certain uh, points of, uh, Mar of uh, Marcus, I would uh, uh, agree partly with your observation that uh, the uh, USSR did not uh, collapse, but the subjective, uh, the uh, personal fact that played a, a huge uh, role. So to some uh, extent, the USSR did not collapse, but was collapsed. But uh, of course, uh, the, uh, that was the part of the uh, problem. There were many uh, problems, including uh, d domestic, uh, the fight for uh, power, the scramble for power in uh, Moscow, uh, many things which uh, contributed to the demise of one of uh, the superpowers. Uh, well, my, my next uh, point on uh, trauma of the uh, 1990s, and Marcus uh, uh, said a few words uh, about the experience of Russian people in the uh, 90s. Well, and uh, really, um, uh, in our mindset and um, uh, psyche, we've got uh, several uh, traumas or uh, syndromes. Uh, the uh, syndrome of the 1990s, uh, 90s these days uh, we would uh, have had much more people in the uh, opposition if not this uh, trauma of the 1990s many people still uh, remember how it was and they uh, do not want uh, revolutions anymore revolutions they uh, want somehow to meddle through uh, inside the country with uh, reforms uh, a lot of people are not uh, satisfied with the pace of these reforms, but uh, definitely they don't want more uh, revolutions and social uh, upheavals. But uh, also we still have the, the syndrome of 22nd of June 1941. This is a, a syndrome which is the bedrock for the strategic threat of uh, uh, Russia up to date. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I would mention the syndrome of uh, Yugoslavia. 1999, uh, the, bo the bombing of, Yugo of Yugoslavia, this is uh, so uh, something which is, uh, which is one of the vehicles of uh, thinking of our politicians and military people and uh, diplomats. So uh, all these uh, factors, from my point of view, should, should, uh, should, should be taken into account. Uh, 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 and now very uh, quickly some uh, comments. Well, uh, the first one is that Russia is back, but at the same time her return is pending. And uh, um, uh, by this I would like to say that uh, p the politically in the foreign policy uh, domain uh, Russia is quite uh, strong. But on the uh, economic side, uh, the, uh, the uh, situation is uh, uh, far from, from uh, satisfactory. Uh, and like it has been mentioned uh, today, the uh, economy of the uh, country should be uh, modernized. And the pandemic, unfortunately, uh, now is uh, well, uh, one of the stumbling uh, blocks but uh, uh, it should be done uh, somehow. Um, and if not, then uh, the uh, impression of that Russia is back uh, uh, could be, uh, well, uh, could be 
eclipsed by uh, by more uh, problems in the coming uh, years and uh, decades. Um, well, uh, my next uh, uh, comment is that uh, Russia, for a very long time after the break of the Soviet uh, Union, was a status quo power. Uh, Russia wanted, you know, to uh, follow the uh, international law and agreements, which uh, which were achieved in the era of uh, uh, the Cold War and many other uh, countries. Uh, uh, including the United States and European uh, ca uh, countries wanted to change a lot, uh, including the uh, uh, borders of uh, Europe, not through uh, military means, but through uh, different uh, projects. Uh, and that was uh, something what, uh, what made uh, Russia ultimately uh, to uh, become not a revisionist power, but a kind of the uh, innovative power in foreign po uh, policy, which tries not just to react, but to uh, act pro, but to, uh, well, uh, to move pro actively, uh, uh, which we saw in, uh, in uh, Syria uh, and in uh, a number of other uh, settings. Uh, well, then, uh, the relations between Russia and uh, China, um, uh, some may call it a marriage of, of uh, convenience or white marriage. This uh, expression I heard uh, in the United Kingdom uh, many years uh, ago, you are, uh, to, you are uh, together, but uh, no love is uh, allowed. Uh, from my point of view, uh, the, uh, this is true, but this is not the uh, the whole picture. From my point of view, the relations between Russia and China are both tactical uh, and uh, strategic. Uh, and if not this huge uh, pressure from uh, the West and uh, sanctions, then uh, strategically Ra Russia and uh, China in uh, any way uh, well, uh, was were going to um, to become much uh, closer, but uh, not uh, at the pace which we have experienced uh, uh, in uh, the last uh, years. Uh, I do not think that uh, uh, I think I think that neither Russia, the United States, or China, or any other uh, country can be uh, can claim these days and can be called super uh, superpowers uh, they can be well uh, the center of uh, power uh, but not uh, super centers they can be uh, a kind of niche superpowers uh, the uh, powers which are super in a certain uh, number of uh, of uh, niches uh, but, uh, you know, the uh, image uh, and the connotation of superpower from the Cold War uh, days, from my point of view, is uh, impossible to project on the uh, reality of the 21st uh, century. And my final uh, remark, well, uh, Russia and the United uh, Kingdom, what kind of bridges can be uh, built? Um, well, both of our uh, countries have very rich uh, cultures. In uh, Russia, a uh, man cannot be considered uh, an uh, educated one uh, if he or she uh, do not know qu uh, quite well uh, Shakespeare and Conan Doyle and Charles Dickens and Tolkien and Oscar Wilde and Wales, uh, Byron, uh, so on uh, and so forth. Uh, and in, uh, in the United uh, Kingdom, which for many years was in the focus of my academic uh, work, the Russian uh, culture is uh, very much appreciated. Uh, and uh, at least uh, people in those uh, circles, which uh, I uh, usually met there uh, and are in touch with, they know uh, the Russian uh, culture uh, quite well. But uh, is it is, uh, uh, if it is uh, sufficient 
for our uh, countries to uh, overcome, you know, the present uh, stage of uh, animosity, I, uh, do, I uh, don't know. Uh, for, for some time, I thought that, you know, the political domain can exist uh, separately from the cultural domain and economic domain. But politics these days is so dominant and so uh, prevailing that uh, that uh, that it uh, distorts uh, hugely, you know, our mutual understanding and uh, relations, uh, even in the sphere of uh, uh, of uh, uh, culture. Uh, so uh, that's all, and it's up to uh, Marcus to reflect on. Uh, uh, any points which I have raised. Thank you very much. Marcus, please. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your very insightful uh, observations. Um, I am infused that should my book be translated into the Russian language, that there would be a rigorous and constructive discussion on what I have written. Um, the same cannot be said uh, about uh, an equivalent discuss discussion taking place in Britain, because over a number of years now, um, intellectually charged discussions in Britain have all but collapsed. Today in Britain, if someone has a different view on, say, Russia, and even if that view um, is a substantiated one, a plausible one, one that deserves to be listened to, the politicians and mainstream media journalists alike will simply attack that view. They will, they will not discuss the view, they will attack the view with the objective being to denigrate the views of the person and to secondly, to try and humiliate that individual the amount of times I have been referred to in the public domain as a, quote, Russian propagandist is too many for me to, uh, to recall now. So gone are the days when Britain used to be a major centre in the world uh, for intellectual discussions. And uh, let me um, make reference to Joseph Stalin, because I think this is an important example. A distinction has to be made between Stalin the man and Stalin the politician, the leader. Because when I said in my presentation and uh, when I say in my book that Stalin was one of Russia's greatest ever leaders, and in my own opinion, the greatest ever leader, I'm not saying that he was a great human being, far from it. I'm not saying that Peter the Great was a great human being. What I am saying is that they were uh, state builders for Russia. They modernized Russia, they industrialized Russia. And uh, the greatest test that Stalinism ever faced uh, was in the Second World War, or as Russians call the Great Patriotic War, because um, Stalinism uh, prevailed over the greatest threat to the survival the Russian people have ever faced. I am very well aware of the costs in lives uh, that the industrialization of the USSR under Stalin um, uh, cost. And that should never be forgotten and that should always be remembered. But Edward I of England, Henry VIII of England, Oliver Cromwell of England were exceptionally strong, successful leaders. But were they good? Human, uh, good human beings? Were they uh, angelic human beings? Far from it. So we have to have um, a mature and intellectually charged discussion, a raucous discussion, but an informative discussion about, for example, Russia under Putin or Russia under Stalin. And I'm delighted that, as I said, if my book is translated into Russian, that is exactly what would happen in Russia. But alas, um, uh, my book will not receive um, that sort of reception in Britain. Thank you, Marcus. 
And thank you very much, uh, Alexei Anatolyevich, for your interesting points and evaluation. I really love the uh, uh, point on the lonely book in the vast ocean of biased view of the propaganda. And Marcus, I think that's a, 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 another great job for your publisher, maybe not just in Russian, uh, to, to, to republish a book, but in Chinese and Spanish, uh, to get it even more uh, scope around the world. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, if we move on to our next speaker from uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Adele Darvish, a uh, British author, historian and political commentator, sometimes writes under the pen name Alex Darwin, and uh, he's in here right now. Um, uh, his, his career as a foreign correspondent for Fleet Street counts to 20 years. And for the past 18 years, Darvish has been based in the parliamentary press gallery of the House of Commons at Westminster, as a Westminster reporter. Um, please, sir. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And thank you very much, Marcus, for the uh, wonderful, uh, uh, comprehensive uh, introductions and follow up. And I also uh, will try to order the book or find a way of reading it. I've just got some problems with my eyes at the moment. Um, it, 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 it is quite interesting, and, and I made quite a few notes yesterday, um, but I think you have covered them. And because my main question was, actually, has Russia been absent from the uh, world scene, world politics? I probably uh, would say it a question, has Russia been absent or, which I totally sympathize with what you said about uh, the orthodoxy uh, as perpetuated by the establishment and media, well, mainstream Western media, although I'm a member uh, of the media, but we journalists are lazy, and I think the subconscious bias is do with group think and let ourselves sort of be brainwashed into an Orwellian way that sort of the power in control of the present is we allow it to rewrite the past thus determining the future, uh, being sort of, I think I'm the oldest um, here. So I became conscious around the Suez War and suddenly the uh, Bulganian uh, 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 and Khrushchev sort of intervention there. I was like about 13 years old uh, at the time. I was still in Alexandria. I hadn't been thrown out at the time. Um, so I I'm aware and I'm covered all these events from the Six Day War onwards. Um, so I don't think Russia has been absent, but I think uh, we allowed ourselves to be in a bubble or in an echo chamber uh, of looking into the news which we like. And if we are not Russophobes or if we prefer Russia to be uh, uh, the good guy, um, we somehow filter the negative media or the negative reports in the media. And since 99% of the reports are negative, so filter them out. So it feels like Russia being absent, it hasn't. And uh, I probably will visit sort of the uh, the areas uh, where uh, Russia uh, came uh, in. Uh, and uh, you talked about Syria a bit, and I think that was quite interesting when the world turned their back uh, on Russia, and we journalists have not been asking the question, who's financing this Islamic terrorist and so on. Obviously, Russia done it from its own point of interest, which was a legitimate interest uh, in interfering in or intervention, rather, as an invitation of the recognized government by the UN of Syria. And I think the main aims were to preserve the geographical integrity of Syria as a nation state, which was not sort of in the West. And interestingly, uh, 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 also the fighting Islamic terrorism, which Russia has been a victim uh, of uh, this terrorism. And if we actually cast our mind back on Afghanistan, where the CIA funded these groups, and I think, again, I was one of the very few voices in the wilderness say, wait, 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 we are actually building, constructing a Frankenstein monster that are going to be out of control. And we have seen what the monster did in 9-11 and the involvement of Al-Qaeda becoming the Islamic State. And by the way, actually, Marcus, it's Islamic State in Iraq and Levant. It's ISIL and not ISIS. I don't know where actually the S, second S come from. 
have no idea. The BBC invented it. And so just sort of, this again, sort of the group thing. Um, the second point I would actually to like to make, actually the return of Russia on the world stage, where we are here now. On the Middle East, which area I covered between, 19, between the Six Day War and 19, 19, almost 1998, um, the, there's two problems actually. One is Iran and Hezbollah. Although the Russian diplomacy had been extremely successful, because in addition to um, Syria and fighting terrorism there, uh, the diplomacy which had been absent, which is getting Turkey and Iran and that part of the world, which I call the proper Middle East or East of the Middle East, uh, they've been extremely successful there. But the, the, the problem is, even for people like me, is Hezbollah, Hezbollah's links with Iran. I know it's quite a, a, a useful leverage in that the Russian, that the Syrian regime used and the Russians had to go with it to fight a menace terrorism, uh, which is the Sunni terrorism there, financed by we, we know who. Um, it, it, that is, it, Hezbollah also is not uh, a progressive force, it's not a liberal force, it's not actually a force that would allow the other opinion, as we have seen in Britain now, which is silencing uh, uh, opinions that it actually differ from the main orthodoxy. So that's another problem that the Russians had to solve in the diplomacy. But I've come to the two main points that are actually preoccupying the British media, apart from Brexit, and Western media in general, which is the so-called climate change. And by the way, the orthodoxy, again, that climate change has been man-made by white man only, no, no anybody else. Uh, and uh, the second one is the new COVID-19 virus and the epidemic worldwide. On the first one, on the climate change, uh, I don't. I think Russia would still remain outside. Not for the same reason that they always make Russia an enemy and the bogeyman there in order to be a useful tool in internal politics. We have seen how the remain campaign in during the Brexit referendum debate have been saying, oh, if we, if, if we break away from the uh, European Union, that will be a present for Putin because he wants to break the uh, European Union. And uh, uh, if someone is actually wanted to demolish their argument, they say, oh, he's working for Russian propaganda and so on. That's not the main, I think the main reason that Russia will not be sort of brought in into the climate change and global warming, it's the same reason that Greta and Ostro and kids do not actually demonstrate outside the Chinese embassy or outside the Brazilian embassy and so on, for a simple reason, because they will not be able to force taxation, the called green taxation on the Russian or Chinese or, or, or Brazilian consumer in order to subsidize the so-called green energy and the beneficiary will love their way to the bank. So Russia is probably out of it. That leave us with the coronavirus, uh, the end COVID-19, and the vaccine. And after six months of rubbishing the Sputnik Russian vaccine and Chinese vaccine and the usual politicizing of uh, the uh, epidemic and so on, the scientists said, wait a minute, there's actually a success here for the Russian vaccine. The rate of success is, uh, is quite high, there's a shortage worldwide. And then we have seen not only uh, in places like the Middle East and African third world, people actually going to Russia for the Sputnik vaccine and the Chinese for the vaccine. We have seen member states of the European Union contracting the Russian supplies for the Russian vaccine. And then we had the, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson here in the weekend in the uh, G7 meeting who is urging people in response to President, French President Macron call for sharing doses of the vaccine. And 
again, Macron, when I was asked to comment on the issue, I said, well, it's a very noble cause. I don't think he's doing it for a charity because if you actually analyze what he was saying, he simply was saying, oh, we in the West have actually left a vaccine, a vaccine politics vacuum going to be filled by the Russian and the Chinese. They're going to promote their uh, interest. You know, it might be true or might not be true. Who knows what the motives are. However, this is an area here which practically the Russia and the world politics can actually move forward because it would be impossible for the usual suspects uh, in the established mainstream media to undermine. Well, they might say the Russians' motives um, are political. So what if I'm actually on a waiting list uh, for cancer treatment and I'm waiting to host for the vaccine and I don't care where the vaccine come from and who the motives were as long as I got the needle in my arm and so on. So this is an area which should be quite difficult for the usual suspect to demonize Russia and China in and I think the cooperation here uh, in that area of uh, fighting the COVID-19 pandemic with the success of the Sputnik vaccine, especially with the trials going on now of mixing vaccine, not mixing vaccine, the second dose of the vaccine being another one. If this trial actually is proven to be uh, correct, then the Russian vaccine, which is more economical uh, to supply and easier to take to that, those parts of the world, that would be good. And I think the UN or, and, uh, uh, and the international organization uh, will be the platform here. I, uh, this is my tap hands uh, uh, worth <laughs> of intervention and thank you very much again, Marcus. Thank you very much, Adel. Thank you. Marcus? Yes, thank you very much, Adel, for your observations. Um, I think the harsh truth is that from uh, the time of the dissolution of the Soviet Union up until around 2007, certainly during the 1990s, Russia was all but absent on the international arena. Why? Because following the end of the Soviet Union, Russia descended into political, economic, military and societal meltdown. And I think that was most brutally demonstrated during the uh, Yugoslav civil wars. Russia um, is historic friends with the Serbs, with the Croatian Serbs, the Bosnian Serbs and then the Serbs of Serbia. And Russia objected uh, first of all, to the breakup of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, and Russia objected to the West's anti-Serb stance uh, during the Yugoslav civil wars, and most notably during the uh, illegal, uh, murderous, monstrous NATO bomb, uh, bombing of Serbia, or as it was then the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. But that was all Russia could do at that point. As I said, Russia in particular had descended into economic meltdown. So there was no way that Russia was going to be able to um, assist the Serbs um, in their hour of peril. I think if we have a look at what happened um, in 1999 in Kosovo and Matokia, when uh, Russian paratroopers arrived in Pristina, the capital of this ancient Serbian province, and secured the airport. Um, the hope uh, then of the Kremlin was that Russia would have, in effect, a bargaining chip with NATO about how Kosovo and Matokia would be administered once the Yugoslav security forces departed from the Serbian province. But what happened was that Russia was not able um, to transport supplies to those Russian uh, forces, paratroopers, at, at Pristina Airport. Why? Because Bulgaria would not allow Russian aircraft to use its airspace to resupply the Russian forces. Initially, Bulgaria um, had given the go-ahead to Moscow to do that, but then Bill Clinton uh, made a telephone call to the then Bulgarian uh, president uh, telling him that if Bulgaria wanted to be admitted 
into both the European Union and NATO, then Bulgaria had to deny Russia access to its airspace to resupply the Russian forces uh, in Pristina. And that is what Sofia ended up doing. And there was nothing that the Russians could do um, to get around that. However, by 2007, uh, Rus the Russian economy um, was already brimming um, with confidence. It was already oozing um, uh, with money. And of course, it was in 2007 when uh, Putin made his uh, famous speech at the Munich Security Conference, um, which I write in my book, symbolized Russia's return to the international arena. That's not to say that nothing was happening from 2000 to 2007, but certainly from 2002 to 2007, that is when, as I said moments ago, Putin realized that under no circumstances did America want a equal relationship with Russia. And secondly, America was intent on placing a cordon sanitaire on Russia's western borders comprised of EU and uh, in particular uh, NATO member states. And it was from 2007 that Russia began to uh, re-enter the international arena. But of course, the turning point was in September of 2015 when uh, Russia legally intervened in the Syrian conflict, a conflict I should add, which was caused by um, uh, American, uh, the American and British governments together with their regional allies, including the Turks and the Saudis. And uh, the day that Putin ordered the Russian military to participate in the Syrian conflict, namely to liberate uh, Syrian territory from the tyranny of Islamist uh, yoke, was, the, uh, was a turning point um, in the, in the uh, global dimensions um, of relations between uh, America and Russia. Thank you very much. Mark. Sorry, on that on Hezbollah and the Hezbollah issue, the concern about Hezbollah, well, if you can address that, please. Well, Russia has a very close relationship uh, with Hezbollah. Um, Hezbollah, let us not forget, um, sent forces to Syria to fight, first of all, against Al Qaeda and ISIS. If I uh, let me cite the example of Malula. Malula is the uh, only place in the world um, where the language of Jesus Christ, Aramaic, is spoken. After the Syrian army liberated Malula from both uh, al-Nusra and also the so-called Free Syrian Army, which, by the way, the American the British were publicly supporting uh, the Free Syrian Army, the Free Syrian Army, the so-called Free Syrian Army, and al-Nusra um, conducted a joint operation to conquer Malula, and they carried out numerous atrocities during their occupation of Malula. But after the Syrian army had liberated Malula, the Syrian army moved on to liberate other uh, Syrian towns and villages from Islamist control, who stayed in Malula to help guard this ancient Christian town. It was, in part, Hezbollah soldiers. Now, as regards to uh, Hezbollah in general, well, it, 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 depends, um, it depends your perspective on this organization. The uh, narrative of Washington and London and Tel Aviv is that Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Uh, my own personal view is that Hezbollah only came into being uh, because of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Uh, had it not been for uh, Hezbollah, and certainly over the last 20 years, then I believe that Israeli illegal intervention in Lebanon would be far more often than what it currently is. And I believe that, um, as I've written in my book and as I said in my presentation, uh, the Middle East and the world in general is witness to an informal strategic partnership between Russia, Syria, Iran and Hezbollah, which is going to tackle the informal relationship, strategic relationship in the Middle East between Britain, America, Israel and Saudi Arabia. I think because of that informal relationship between Moscow, Damascus, Tehran and Hezbollah, whilst Western predominance in the Middle East will remain indefinitely, nonetheless, the Americans, the British, the Israelis and the Saudis 
will have to take into consideration from now on the informal partnership between the Russians, the Syrians, the Iranians, and Hezbollah. And uh, I believe that that will help to usher in some degree of uh, peace and stability in the Middle East, because I think it means that um, the prospect of American and British military crusades in the Middle East um, will, will become somewhat less likely um, going forward because of Russia's newfound influence and power in the Middle East and its informal partnership with the Iranians, the Syrians and Hezbollah. Thank you very much, Marcus. And thank you, Adel. Thank you very much. Great points. And, uh, well, great idea about the uh, vaccine and uh, a bit utopian, but nevertheless great that uh, all nations uh, should work uh, together fighting common evil and uh, really get to the finish line uh, together. This is not a competition for sure. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And we move on to our uh, next speaker from Russia, uh, Yelena Ananya. Yelena Vladimirovna, head of uh, the Center for British Studies at the Institute of Europe of the Russian Academy of Sciences, International Affairs Observer. Yelena Vladimirovna, прошу вас. Thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting discussion. And uh, I've read the book. And I congratulate uh, Dr. Papadopoulos for this book. And it is very honest. Uh, so you are a very brave man. And uh, my observation is uh, that uh, at the beginning of the book and in the epilogue of the book, you write about so to say, domestic situation in Russia, uh, why uh, people support Putin and uh, uh, what brought uh, this support uh, to life. Uh, and uh, probably uh, in uh, the second edition of the book, uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, you uh, write uh, on these point, um, well, add more material, because this is very important that uh, people uh, in the West understand uh, what's going on in Russia internally. Uh, in domestic uh, politics. Uh, what strikes me uh, these uh, days having followed uh, British domestic uh, politics and foreign policy for uh, quite a time is the deterioration of uh, Russian studies in the UK. Well, not only Russian studies, uh, but uh, uh, the deterioration of studies of uh, Russia and um, using Russia in domestic uh, political battles as a scapegoat is uh, striking. Uh, I would uh, name just, uh, well, two uh, examples is that uh, even in uh, 2014, or maybe it was 2000, uh, 15, uh, the Parliamentary Committee on uh, the UK relations with the EU uh, had a, a hearing on uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, crisis. Uh, there were witnesses from uh, Russia, Russian diplomats, officials, uh, Russian opposition, Novos Kasyara, for instance, and Khodorkovsky, as far as I remember, there were witnesses uh, from the British academic circles, uh, Derek Haver and Andrew Monaghan, uh, and, uh, well, different people from different circles and from the uh, and British diplomats. And if we take uh, the report, which was called Russia, and uh, published uh, in July, 2020 by the committee on the parliamentary committee on intelligence and security it is striking that uh, no such uh, witnesses were called there were only four people and absolutely um, anti-russian uh, uh, well with 
anti-Russian stance in their guts. So no objective knowledge and this um, ignorance uh, of uh, Russia and uh, a lack of um, intention to know Russia uh, is uh, just uh, very uh, disappointing. The thing is, to me, is uh, that the rift between Russia and the West now, it is not ideological. This uh, human uh, rights uh, agenda, uh, to me, is just a cover up of uh, geopolitics. It's pure geopolitics and nothing else. So uh, when, uh, and this uh, human rights theme is uh, very, so to say, advantageous and profitable because there are 140 million people in Russia. And if you discuss uh, the human rights of every single citizen, then it's endless. And uh, the West has, uh, as I said already, no inclination uh, to know and to understand. In fact, uh, this uh, expression, uh, understanding Russia or understanding Putin is a blame word. So if you don't know your adversary, so you cannot take uh, reasonable decisions. And uh, in the West, what they do with their adversaries they uh, paint them as brutal dictators and not only brutal dictators but crazy dictators since they're crazy they are very dangerous so must get rid of them so uh, your book is uh, very uh, informative uh, but uh, well you will have many problems with it in the uk so Russia was used as a scapegoat in domestic politics in the UK between the Brexiteers and the uh, Remainers. Dominic Grieve, former uh, general attorney of um, the realm, uh, was head of this uh, parliamentary committee on intelligence and security. He was a uh, and is a staunch uh, Remainer. So uh, this. Uh, report named Russia uh, was intended uh, to uh, to paint in black uh, Johnson. Well, uh, I couldn't say that I'm uh, for Johnson or the Brexiteers, but it was just uh, intended for um, domestic politics. And that is uh, a very sad case. So I would like to congratulate you on this book, uh, a very honest book, and uh, you express profound knowledge. And this is uh, well, for us a success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helena. Thank you for your main points. Marcus? Thank you for sharing your impressions of uh, my book with me. I think one of the main factors in accounting for tension between the West and Russia, and when I say the West, I'm naturally referring to America and Britain, because both countries form the nucleus of what is known as the West. But I think one of the main factors is the moral and cultural sense of superiority that the uh, American and British establishments um, have. And I think at the same time, it is this um, enduring view um, within Whitehall, a view which goes back hundreds of years, that the Russian people are not only a threat to the uh, freedom and civilization of Europe, but that they are at best a semi-human people. And that is not um, melodramatic language. All you need to do is to visit the National Archives in Kew, formerly the Public Record Office, and have a look at how British officials, um, diplomats included, but in particular British military officials, how they were, how they were uh, describing 
uh, the Russian people, the ordinary Russian person, how they were described in the Russian language, how they were described in uh, Russian culture in the 1700s, in the 1800s, in the 1900s, and into the 20th century. Um, uh, you know, through my own um, doctoral research, I came across one British official who wrote that um, even the Russian language is, quote, repulsive. And we hear during the war years, um, uh, Winston Churchill, who was at that point prime minister, uh, saying that he has been informed uh, how the Russian people are lower than the orangutan. Now, I mean, it, it really is, you know, on the face of it, absolutely ludicrous and um, unimaginable that people could think like this about another race. But the harsh truth of the matter is that that is exactly how the British or the British establishment have viewed Russia over hundreds of years. And I have no doubt about it in my mind that in 70 or 80 years time, when we are allowed to have a look at the um, records, files from the British Ministry of Defence, Defence, British Ministry of Defence, or the British um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, about how they're describing Russia today, you will see a very similar style of language uh, being used to describe Russia. So I think there's this um, ingrained fear within the British establishment that uh, Russia, that Asia, in the form of Russia, is threatening. Uh, the Western world, this uh, perception that the Russian people are at best a semi-human people, a view that the Russian people are a savage people, and a sense of Anglo-Saxon superiority. And if you combine all of that with the reality that today Russia um, is again a superpower, not, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a superpower in the sense that the USSR was, but still um, a superpower, that means that the British establishment is going to have to use all means at its disposal, and the same for the American establishment, to um, denigrate um, the views of the Russian government when it comes to um, affairs at home and abroad, and to ensure that public opinion in America and uh, in Britain is resoundingly um, negative in its perception of Russia. Um, you know, there is no, rarely does uh, British mainstream media or American mainstream media uh, corroborate its accusations uh, uh, against Russia with any evidence whatsoever. You know, we hear that the Sputnik vaccine um, is, you know, potentially uh, not safe, though, we, though that view has not been substantiated. You know, we, hear, we heard the view that Russia... The Russian military was bombing hospitals and schools in Syria. Well, once again, that was never corroborated with any form of evidence um, whatsoever. What I would say is that um, how Britain, uh, how the British establishment um, is targeting Russia today differs somewhat in how it has targeted Russia over centuries, in that I do believe today the Russian people are being even more demonised um, by, for example, uh, British newspapers than they have ever been demonised before. I think during the Cold War, the Russian people, the Soviet people, were projected in Britain and in America as an enslaved people. And it is in the interests of the Soviet people um, uh, to have um, the British and American notions of democracy and economic prosperity. Um, but today, it is very apparent, in my estimation anyhow, that um, the Russian people are being targeted um, by the British establishment like the Russian people had not been um, targeted before. One more comment. Uh, well, I wonder what uh, would the British uh, have said if uh, Russia followed the political system, uh, democratic political system of uh, the United Kingdom, having a constitutional monarchy, an elected lower chamber and an un unelected uh, upper chamber with uh, party nominees uh, sitting there. So what would have the UK, what the UK 
would have said if that was the case. Well, so uh, I pro probably they will say, oh, it's different, as uh, they usually say on any uh, example on the part of uh, Russia. That's different. That's a different case. Well, thank you very much for your book once again. Can, can I quickly just respond to that, Anton? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, I'll, I'll be very quick. Uh, British politicians and mainstream journalists um, purport that Britain is a beacon of democracy and freedom in the world. However, on closer inspection, uh, that view um, um, really uh, does not, uh, is, is, is really flawed because uh, the British, because the uh, upper house of the British Parliament, the House of Lords, is unelected. And the British head of state, the monarch, is also unelected. So how on earth um, is that democracy? And if we turn to the concept of a constitutional monarchy, well, I would contend that is simply the um, language of British officialdom as a way of saying that Britain has um, evolved with, um, uh, ha has evolved over the last couple of centuries, that no longer does a British monarch um, possess or exert any power whatsoever. Well, if you believe that, then I sincerely suggest that you return uh, to school because the argument that the British monarch has no powers whatsoever and plays no role in British economic policy making and foreign policy making and defence policy making is preposterous nonsense. The reality is that the, con the British concept of a constitutional uh, democracy has no meaning in practice. It is merely the language of British officialdom. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for great points. Thank you, Elena Vladimir. But, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you must agree but, uh, that the uh, United Kingdom and Russia has great uh, heritage and great history of friendship and cooperation as well. Uh, even taking the modern history of, uh, let's say, 75 years, the twinning of the cities during the Second World War, or, or Stalingrad, Volgograd, and uh, Coventry, or the recent history, even with the latest uh, five to seven years of uh, three uh, cross-cultural years, a year of culture, a year of education, a year of science, a uh, year of literature, and I think another one is coming next year. Uh, yes, it's uh, it's interesting relations, but you, as you say, it's a different story. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, can we move on, please, to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Nikolai Tapornin. Is he here? Uh, director of the Center for the European Information, Associate Professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation. Yes. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thank you, Marcus, for this uh, kind invitation uh, to participate in this uh, very remarkable event. Uh, and uh, also uh, thank you to my colleagues who are present here from British side and from Russian side. Uh, there. Uh, contributions are of great uh, interest and of great importance in, for me as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as a number of other speakers, I didn't uh, read the whole book uh, because I didn't have such opportunity. But I have some, I have read some chapters, uh, some clips, uh, and uh, I can say that is a remarkable, a remarkable job that uh, uh, Marcus uh, has done. Really, uh, in my view, it is uh, very difficult uh, being in Britain these days to write uh, such uh, positive book in general. I mean, positive book about Russia, about Russia. It's, uh, Marcus, you are, you are really brave, a brave man in my view. Uh, I don't know if how many people in Britain uh, will be able to to read this book or whether whether it would be of interest. To, for general public, for academicians, for for professors, for students, for scientists, I don't know because uh, uh, really I understand that Russia is not a, 
point number one for uh, for Britain for, for 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 their people, especially during these days during hard hard time when uh, people have to struggle against coronavirus and uh, other other very serious illness. Uh, but in fact, of course, uh, maybe maybe one day uh, if if they have a time to 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 read more about Russia, this this publication uh, will be for them very interesting because it gives you it gives them other other look uh, the events which are taking place in Russia, which uh, took place in Soviet Union and, uh, and this uh, decades which have left already, uh, and uh, maybe they can uh, have more uh, general general picture of the events uh, which. Uh, uh, happened in, uh, in the Soviet Union and then uh, late in Russia. Uh, really, really, of course, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, Britain and the Soviet Union and Russia has ever had, had a good cooperation. Uh, this is not true in my view. And we uh, maybe we uh, can uh, disagree with it with uh, with Marcos or with other colleagues. Uh, actually, in history. Between our countries, uh, we were more rivals than friends, and this is uh, truth. This is the truth because uh, uh, we can we can go uh, we can look back at Tsarist time, at uh, Queen's time, and King's time in England, uh, and we, uh, we can look at uh, Soviet Union and uh, Great Britain time, and under Stalin, under Khrushchev, under Brezhnev, under maybe not under Gorbachev time, but. Uh, when uh, when Communist Party ruled ruled Soviet Union, we didn't have uh, good cooperation with Britain. And uh, later, later, later under, uh, under Yeltsin and uh, under Putin time, we did uh, some some uh, short periods of time when we cooperated. And I remember in the beginning of uh, zeros when when Prime Minister. Uh, Came uh, from Labour Party, uh, came came to Le to Leningrad to St. Petersburg, and uh, they had a very interesting discussion with uh, Putin, and that was a kind of uh, 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 new possibility to establish such uh, closer cooperation with Britain. But uh, uh, later, later, it didn't happen. So my view that uh, we didn't uh, have uh, strong ties with Britain in the history. We were more rivals than friends. It's, it's truth. The, uh, of course, we can we can uh, refer to the Great Patriotic War, uh, 41, uh, 45, and uh, we were uh, together in anti anti Hitler coalition. That was a great great time indeed. Uh, but later on, uh, we uh, know about the, the famous uh, Churchill uh, speech at Fulton uh, when he uh, uh, mentioned so-called uh, new iron. Curtain between uh, between uh, Western countries and the Soviet Union, and we we uh, usually uh, give this example of uh, Western attitude uh, towards uh, Soviet Union, and we say that hey, Churchill started this uh, policy of cold cold uh, uh, war of this uh, uh, non-confidence relationship with the Soviet Union. That is true. Also, that is true. We, at the same time, we we remember Churchill, the great uh, contributor to the to the victory of over over fascism, fascism over Hitler. But uh, then later he uh, started a new period of uh, Cold War between between Soviet Union and Western Western community. Uh, but nevertheless, we we should understand that uh, such countries uh, like uh, Russia and uh, Great Britain they are very prominent uh, prominent uh, uh, players in the international field, and uh, it is very important that such countries should cooperate. Should cooperate if we want if we want to to have uh, the situation of stability, situation of uh, good security in the world, and. Uh, uh, whether like whether you like or you don't like Russia or Great Britain or the United States, it's uh, destiny of these countries, uh, destiny of politicians to cooperate with each other, to cooperate with each other, try to overcome uh, differences, uh, different views on uh, that or another international event, and try to find compromises. 
and it's a big pity that these days uh, we cannot uh, speak about uh, finding compromises between our countries we are more and more speaking about finding differences between our countries between our approaches to different uh, various international problems that is a pity that is a great pity and uh, for the time being we we uh, we, we we should uh, know how appreciate uh, this change in the world politics and uh, should uh, think how to overcome it uh, really really uh, it should be it should be clear it should be clear to our uh, colleagues in the western community that uh, russia is a self uh, uh, self governing self uh, um, grounded uh, country which can uh, survive uh, without uh, good cooperation let, let's put it mildly good cooperation with western with western uh, community so we uh, it is of course not maybe a very good way of uh, uh, surviving but nevertheless we have possibilities to have uh, potential we have everything so that is this is true if we cut if we cut ties and uh, uh, links with the Western society, as uh, Minister Lavrov put uh, just uh, a few days ago, then nothing will happen with Russia. Uh, nothing will happen with Russia. For the, for the time being, borders are being closed, and uh, it is not clear when uh, when it will be opened because of pandemic, because of other things. And we see that uh, nothing is going on. So I mean, nothing uh, tragic is going on. So countries. Uh, continue to to live continue to work continue to survive if you if you put it uh, and the, the same with britain britain just left uh, european union i remember we have with marcus uh, very interesting discussions uh, over uh, wide, uh, video bridges between london and moscow and we discuss how it will affect uh, uh, brexit how it will affect uh, british society british economy and uh, British uh, British political uh, guidance in view with cooperation with the United States with uh, with the European Union with Russia and nothing has happened. Uh, the, the tragic, I mean, that Britain still continues to be a very prominent state. Uh, so, but uh, I said that maybe it will uh, uh, it will uh, put some consequences uh, to British politics because uh, when you are uh, among other 28 uh, prominent uh, states and leading European states, and together with uh, France, together with Germany, together with Italy, we have more potentials. We have more potential to influence uh, international uh, events, international uh, politics. But uh, Britain has uh, uh, chosen to, 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 to go their own way, to go their own way. And maybe uh, we will see, we will see in the future if they succeed. Uh, Russia, Russia for the time being, unfortunately for the time being, is uh, put under such uh, under such circumstances where, where we have to go our own way. Our president said that uh, there are national uh, aims of uh, Russian state. There are there are certain uh, certain views, and we uh, should follow it. So we should. Uh, uh, defend our national interests and uh, that was put by the way not uh, not uh, solely uh, president putin that was put by president trump when he was uh, in office in the united states but, uh, i will remember in uh, 2016 uh, when he proposed the uh, uh, idea that america first first of all america make america great again that was uh, his uh, motto and uh, after all uh, countries started to repeat it in certain extent to, to repeat uh, china says it's all it also has a, uh, its national interests uh, russia has uh, united kingdom has france john european union so on uh, every country started to follow to follow this way of uh, uh, presenting its role in international international fields that is why uh, we came to such a condition when uh, we lost we lost uh, common grounds we lost common grounds unfortunately and uh, uh, now we have uh, the possibility when trump left the office in washington and biden came we have a possibility maybe to to start uh, 
to start again uh, to find compromises, uh, to find uh, our common solutions to international uh, crisis uh, in certain in certain uh, regions. Uh, but uh, what uh, we see and what we have uh, heard from Biden when he uh, intervened in Munich uh, conference, which uh, which took place uh, two days ago, actually. He said that uh, we should unite, United States should unite with the European Union, with Germany, with uh, France. Uh, he didn't mention, to my mind, if I'm correct, he didn't mention Great Britain, but he mentioned, uh, first of all, European Union. And uh, they unite, uh, why they unite against challenges. And challenges, uh, uh, he mentioned, the challenges are Russian Federation China. So you see, you see, uh, that West, again, is uh, not thinking about finding compromises, but uh, it's not again uh, to make another attempt to unite uh, against uh, Russia and China. Of course, uh, if you if you uh, announce such policy, uh, what you would expect from uh, Russian government or from Chinese government? Of course, uh, we have to, 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 to find uh, our so-called defense policy against uh, such uh, unification and we will uh, more cooperate of course with uh, china as well because china is a strategic partner of russian federation and uh, we of course we many times we we, we say to our colleagues in, uh, in western europe and united states we, we say that we are a european country we are we are, we are european people we have we have the same uh, religion, we have the same ideology, same thinking, they, maybe we have common history with uh, Western world, so Russia is a European country, but if if you try to bridge new curtains uh, from Russia, okay, what, what we can do, maybe we cannot influence it, if President Biden uh, want to unite with, with the European Union against Russia, we cannot change it, but we, we, we have to to construct our own policy, how to go on with it. So and we, we, of course, do it because we have such experience during Soviet Soviet time and during Tsarist time, by the way. It's, we shouldn't forget about it. We shouldn't forget about it. We have such experience, so we, we, we will go on. But it's a pity. Really, it's a great pity if we, if we again, will we'll lose uh, four years' time. I think that Biden unlikely will be re-elected for another term. But for years time, we'll again, we'll lose. We'll lose, we will try to, to unite against each other. We unite with China, uh, United States unite with European Union, and perhaps with Great Britain against against Russia, against, uh, against uh, China, and uh, what will come out of it. Uh, so situation is uh, very, very difficult and uh, uh, in my view, it's very important that we have such a discussion. Maybe uh, mostly we discuss uh, today not the uh, the content of uh, Marcus' great book, uh, but we discuss more uh, politics. We discuss more uh, events which uh, uh, worrying us. Uh, so maybe maybe it is a good idea for our colleagues uh, from uh, Ross Trudnichstvo to organize it on a permanent basis, uh, such uh, meetings uh, in Zoom, for example, just to discuss, to exchange, to have exchange of views on different international problems. It would be a good example of uh, our uh, scientific, academic, cultural societies to find bridges, to find bridges between uh, West and East, West and East. So, so once again, uh, I uh, want to congratulate my friend and my colleague Marcus for, for his uh, remarkable work. Uh, my, it's a really excellent, excellent job writing uh, this book. Uh, I very much anticipate when when he sends me at least one copy, <laughs> so I can have a possibility to read. And I already told him that if he sent me two copies, I, I would uh, put uh, one copy in our library, so students and professors and academicians of uh, Gimo University have the opportunity to read uh, this very interesting book and maybe to use it in their academic researches, why not?
Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, it was uh, for me a big pleasure to participate in this uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you, Nikolai Borisovich, and uh, thank you for great idea to uh, permanently host uh, this kind of events, and uh, maybe not just on Zoom platform, as soon we hopefully we move into the real world. Uh, but another platform is trending right now. Maybe you heard the Clubhouse, which is everyone is using now. Uh, so we'll think about that, creating room for this kind of discussions. Marcus, thank you very much again. Marcus, uh, evaluating that. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai, for your participation and your comments. Whilst Britain and Russia found themselves in an alliance with one another, both during the First and Second World War, this alliance was one of necessity, not one of genuine friendship. During the Second World War, there were elements, by no means all, but there were elements within the British establishment, for example, military intelligence officers, who were hoping for a German victory in Russia. Certainly the um, Soviet counteroffensive outside of Moscow in December 1941, which uh, pushed the German invaders uh, somewhat away from the gates uh, of Moscow, was met with doom and gloom by some military intelligence officers in London. And that was received with outcry from a number of British diplomats, specifically in the Northern Department. And then if we move forward to 1945, just weeks after the end of uh, the European war, Winston Churchill mooted the idea to his chiefs of staff about, a, uh, about, a re uh, about the idea of attacking Soviet forces in Eastern Europe um, through a combined American and British force, together with 100,000 rearmed former Wehrmacht uh, soldiers. Now, uh, this is known as Operation Unthinkable. It was a file which was found in the National Archives, or as it was then the Public Record Office, in either 1998 or 1999. So what does that show? Well, first of all, clearly it shows that Winston Churchill never regarded the wartime alliance between Britain and the Soviet Union um, as, uh, as an indefinite one, and certainly not one of friendship. And it showed um, that Winston Churchill had a dangerously hostile approach to Russia. The fact that um, the Soviet people um, bore the brunt of Nazi Germany's legions the, that the fact that the Soviet, uh, that the Soviet army uh, destroyed the most potent uh, military force in human history, the Wehrmacht, that in the space of something like one and a half years, approximately, had conquered Europe. The fact that the Soviet people made the sacrifice um, of millions of their people to uh, defeating the Third Reich um, was immaterial to people like Winston Churchill, but was just weeks after Nazi Germany um, had been conquered and destroyed. Here was the British Prime Minister talking with his um, chiefs of staff about an attack on Soviet forces in Eastern Europe and, of course, in Germany to push them back into the Soviet Union. Um, an absolutely abhorrent idea and even more abhorrent because Churchill uh, proposed that um, it, it a proposed idea would have involved um, uh, having rearmed 100,000 former Wehrmacht soldiers. Absolutely um, an unthinkable idea, and that's what it was known as, unthinkable. As regards um, uh, any impact, uh, positive or negative, that Brexit may have on uh, Britain's stance on Russia, well, I have said before in numerous uh, television interviews, and in numerous uh, conferences, and in numerous speeches, um, that Britain's position on Russia uh, will, uh, will not change in the slightest bit as a result of Brexit. And of course, I'm talking at a political level. Britain um, will continue to um, agitate um, in the Western world for an even more hardline position on Russia. And, uh, Russia, and Britain will undoubtedly 
um, imposed its own sanctions on Russia now that Britain is out of the European Union. Uh, ironically enough, um, uh, there is a chance, albeit an extremely slim one, that relations between the EU and Russia could improve. Um, that doesn't look like it's going to happen now because of the EU stance on Alexei Navalny. But uh, I, I said last year, and I said even at the beginning of this year, there's a remote chance relations between Brussels and London could improve, while, uh, between, uh, between Brussels and Moscow. Why? Because Britain is out of the European Union. If you go back to 2014, or the beginning of 2014, uh, the Germans and the French, um, Germany and France, are, of course, the engine of the European Union. The Germans and the French were reluctant to place EU sanctions on Russia. But it was Britain's uh, pressure which it exerted on Berlin and Paris that um, made a considerable um, impact and uh, played a considerable role in the EU placing sanctions on Russia. Um, it is my uh, opinion um, that Britain, during its membership of the European U Union, was lobbying and lobbying hard on behalf of American um, objectives. Um, that all said, however, um, uh, the EU is a strategic friend and partner um, to America. The EU coordinates its foreign policy and defence policy making um, with um, uh, America. The EU is not an independent um, entity, as its leaders uh, claim it to be. If the EU uh, truly is independent, then it should demonstrate it by growing a backbone and saying to both America and Britain that they are not going to take any actions which, uh, which will further jeopardise um, its trade and investment relationship with Russia. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you for this. Uh, gentlemen, do you have any more points you'd like to discuss or make? Please raise your hand or switch. Adele, please. Uh, yes, uh, one quick point, actually. I um, wasn't trying to be utopian. I'm just saying this will be hard uh, for the usual suspect to demonize, uh, demonize Russia because then they can go over the heads of that uh, firewall put by uh, Western media and cliches and so on to appeal to people so directly. And the second point, I think, which actually Fyodor uh, meant, uh, made, was the um, this desire, uh, and I think Elena also touched upon it, uh, of if Russia changed um, her culture, her socio-culture and politics to fit the image uh, uh, they push it as a democratic country. Will it work? I don't think it will because the call itself is disingenuous because the very trends uh, who call for human rights and changing culture and so on are the very trends who actually defend oppressive regimes, especially in the Muslim world, uh, absolutely totally backward. But the like the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, they are hugged and loved by the BBC and the establishment. So I don't think even if Russians uh, change their culture, uh, it will work. Again, thank you very much, Anton, for hosting this one. And thank you so much, Marcos. And I will try to order the book. And please do exchange our emails with everyone else. I thank you. Anton, yes. uh, Anton can I make a few very points? Much. Yes, please, Neil. Thank you. OK. I, uh, I'll just try to be as brief as I can. But there are quite a few points I'd like to go over in the uh, uh, not having said that much right in the beginning. Uh, and I, I'm much more upbeat about the relationship over the uh, lost millennium of um, uh, Britain, England with Russia. Uh, one has to remember already uh, almost a thousand years ago, the Grand Duke of Kiev, Grand Prince of Kiev, I should say, married the daughter of King Harold. Um, and their descendant is actually a professor in Cambridge at this uh, moment, uh, Professor Zinoviev. So that was already a good start. Uh, in the time of Ivan the Terrible, there was quite a lot of negotiations about him marrying Queen Elizabeth the Great. And there was, I, I have to say, I think a lot of friendship between the two countries then and a huge amount of trade 
began flourishing with the Moscovy Company. So I think that's another un uh, upbeat uh, aspect. Uh, to go to uh, the comment about Churchill and uh, Russians being orangutans, I think that has to be put in the context that that was said when he understood that the uh, uh, um, security people in Russia were listening to the room where they were. And he was saying that deliberately in a sort of humorous way to um, provoke them. Uh, let me also say that uh, talking about the Second World War in the 30s and right after the war, one shouldn't lose fact of, of uh, um, the fact, presence of the fact that Bolshevism and communism, unlike Russia today, but those ideologies were considered are considered um, uh, abhorrent ideologies. And that is also the case amongst a lot of people in Russia today. You only have to read the books of Metropolitan Tikhon in Skov, who has pointed uh, this out about the nefarious aspects of Bolshevism and um, communism. Now, the other thing I want to mention is in the beginning of the 19th century, um, Tsar Alexander I came to Russia and there were big celebrations of balls and other events in the clubs of St. James's and he was greeted with far more affection and warmth than um, King George III, who was ill of course, or his son the Prince Regent. That was probably the heyday of British-Russian uh, relations. Uh, moving on, the Queen, as you mentioned, is very important and has a much greater role than one appreciates. But I would say, and uh, I certainly don't want to get involved in Russian politics, but uh, I think amongst a lot of Brits were Rus the Russians to um, re-establish a constitutional monarchy. I think there would be a lot of rejoicing in Britain among lots of people, they wouldn't at all be um, horrified by it, in my view. Now, when um, it was mentioned that about Russia being an ally of Iran, Venezuela, Iran, I would say that for a lot of people in Russia, in the West, in fact, all over the world, these countries are not paragons of political, economic, social, or cultural virtues today. So I think it would be much better in terms uh, for Russia's relations, for its image to be associated with other countries which are perceived worldwide, not just by the West, as far more successful. Also, I don't think anyone mentioned the fact that um, Russia may have very effective diplomatic relations with Iran, but it has, in my view, even more so with Israel. And let us not forget um, the huge number of um, Russians of Jewish or part Jewish extraction living in um, Israel uh, who have a great relationship, not only with Russia, but with uh, President um, Putin. And finally, let me say that I think uh, if there's one thing that's obvious to anyone listening to Radio 3 or Radio 4 of the BBC in this country is that Russian culture is perceived as one of the, if not the, one of the greatest cultures in the world. All the time on Radio 3 and 4 and even a lot on uh, television, there are a whole series of programs which glorify Russian music, theatre, art, architecture, and literature. And we have in this country, I think, 45 direct descendants of Alexander Pushkin, including two duchesses, the uh, Dowager Duchess of Westminster and the Duchess of Abercorn, are direct descendants of Pushkin. So I, 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 I'm going to have to go soon, but I just want to conclude that I think one can be far more upbeat about the building of bridges and the future of Anglo-Russian relationships. Thank you all, and I've enjoyed all the conversations we've had today.
Thank you very much, Professor. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you for your points. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are at the point to conclude uh, this uh, event, this book presentation. Uh, we all agree that wouldn't be nice to not have so much franticism around. Wouldn't be nice that to get rid of all the stereotypical thinking, conflict and a false sense of um, real danger or urgency and normalize the uh, relationships between uh, Russia and uh, all the countries in the world. I mean, this, this really remains a rhetorical question. And I guess Arise Russia is here to, for, for people to um, uh, show another point of view. So, uh, Dr. Papadopoulos, dear speakers, thank you very much for taking part in this uh, afternoon session. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you all with us. Marcus, best of luck with the book. Uh, we wish you all good health and speedy recovery from the 2020 um, uh, pandemic, which started last year. Hopefully, it will come to the end this year. And uh, as they say in the United Kingdom, stay safe. Uh, maybe soon not stay home. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll watch TV and, and see, see, see what we, we told about this. But I really hope to see you soon all in real life back at the Russian Cultural Center and all the live events and the fantastic uh, uh, cultural uh, life uh, that uh, London provides. Thank you for this fruitful discussion. Uh, and we, we value your opinion very much and uh, we'll definitely organize the exchange of contacts for the future projects. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much. Thank you.